Okay, I'll start here. Uh, it was 2004, and I was in Rome for a symposium. And I had the opportunity to tour the Vatican after hours. It was a private tour. And as we neared the Sistine Chapel, the tour guide turned to me and said, now, because this is a private tour and the Vatican is closed, if you would like to, you can lie on the floor and take Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel in. OK. Uh, so I'm raised a Catholic. And this was like the ultimate backstage pass. So there I am, lying on the floor. And this pounding set of questions comes to me. How does this happen? How does creative output at this scale and at this quality occur in a culture? And that question became an eight-year research obsession from which I have yet to uh, recover. I wrote a book on it uh, called The Renaissance Generation. And um, the thesis of the book is essentially this, that the conditions that we are facing right now are what it looks like right before a renaissance, that indeed we are poised for another renaissance. Now, I realize that we are living in difficult times, and it's uh, probably challenging for you to share my level of enthusiasm for this. But I did come prepared with evidence. But first, I want to lay a foundation by telling you a little bit about the work of a gentleman named Pitarim Sorokin, who I discovered early in my research. He founded the sociology department at Harvard. And he wrote four volumes, each over 400 pages long, on the rise and fall of great civilizations. This was his life's work. So I only have 18 minutes. I'm going to boil this down for you. <laughs> Essentially, the thing that helps us leap into a renaissance is also the same thing that can hurl us into a dark age. Progress. Progress is the culprit. Because what happens with every great civilization is that it undergoes a period of hyper-change. And this hyper-progress has the effect of making certain value systems and mores and even institutions no longer meaningful in people's lives. So they simply start being shed. And that creates space for the new. Now, not everything gets shed. Some things get brought forward because they're still relevant. The purpose of my talk here today for you is to share with you some of what I've learned in these eight years so that you and your work and your ideas will not get shed. They will get brought into the future. OK, now to the evidence. How do I know that we are poised for another renaissance? There are three indicators. The first is death comes first. I think, do I feel any argument about that, that we're living through that right now? Um, but you know, if you look back at the Italian Renaissance uh, at the time, right before the dawn of the Renaissance, the population of Rome was down to 50,000. So just imagine Manhattan with 50,000 people living in it. Uh, the next thing that occurs is there's always a facilitating medium. And this facilitating medium allows people to exchange ideas and information. Again, in the European Renaissance, there was this vast network of Roman roads that allowed people to travel, have experiences, and exchange information. Today, we have the internet. Now, there's this third category called we enter an age of enlightenment. And I have, in the eight years that I've been talking about this topic, shied away from this because it's a messy general category. And it makes me have to have conversations in front of typically business people about things like um, our connection to the divine and spirituality and creativity and inspiration. And, and so to not get myself delisted, I just stayed away from it. <laughs> but there was something about getting this invitation <laughs> to come and talk that I thought it's time to come out of the closet and start talking about the Age of Enlightenment primarily because I think it has everything to do with the future of creative work 
And as my recent research has proven to me on, uh, in terms of younger audiences, it has a great deal to do with how you're going to appeal to a younger audience who, by the way, is your future. Steppenwolf Theater came to us uh, a couple of years ago, and um, they were seeing that their subscriber base was dwindling one funeral at a time. <laughs> and said, we would like you to go out and identify the global brands that are having a great deal of success in reaching younger audiences. Learn their best practices and bring them back to us. So we did. I went out and I talked to people at Google and Facebook and Red Bull and Ford Motor Company. And as I stand back from what I learned from that, all of those brands who were doing their best work reaching young audiences did one thing very well. Whether they knew it or not, some of them did and were intentional and others were not. They had just happened upon it. And that is that they were able to speak at a higher frequency. Now, I'm not talking about you know, Twitter and, and Facebook and social media. That's just scratching the surface. My job is to tell you what's going on underneath the culture. And, and this higher frequency, there's a recipe to it. And I want to share that with you. The first thing that you have to understand about the higher frequency is that, um, well, in the milieu that younger generations, uh, the younger generation was raised in, um, they experience truth and are persuaded in different ways. Truth is not an intellectual exercise for them. And that is because, classic New Yorker cartoon. Nobody knows you're a dog on the internet. Right? Following this dog metaphor, when you're speaking at this higher frequency, it is like having a dog whistle. You can be heard above the din. So, how truth is experienced is as emotional truth. They believe what they can feel. This is a photo of Brad Pitt from the 1999 film Fight Club. It has not been shed by younger generations, especially by younger generations of young males. It has been brought into the future. And the reason is because it speaks a certain kind of emotional truth to them. Here's another ingredient to this, this frequency. And that is that this is a generation that feels a, a yearning for a higher purpose. But how they achieve this higher purpose is not an individual journey. It's a journey that only gets achieved as they understand it through human connection. So when I discovered this, I, was, um, I wanted to understand this. And that led me to brain research that has been done for 20 years, coming out of the University of Parma about how our brains are evolving socially. And in fact, what I would learn is that we are more and more becoming wired to be social and to feel a sense of human connection. And how this works is we have a matrix of neurons called mirror neurons, both, sides of the, both hemispheres of the brain. And what this allows us to do is to witness something have the experience of it, empathize with it, then we begin to imagine what we would do in that same situation. And here's the, the fourth thing that it does that is remarkable and elevates all of this social engagement well beyond anything like sympathy or empathy, is that it inspires the person to want to act. I would offer up to you that I think this has a lot to do with what, what went on in Zuccotti Park. But there's a caveat that is so delicious, I can't tell you how exciting it was to be able to bring it to you today. 
okay? <laughs> I know, I'm a research nerd, all right? But it doesn't get any better from this, and I am not making this up. Anybody who needs the notes, you know, and the citations from the research, I'm happy to share them after my talk. Here's the big caveat to this process of compassion. It's most powerful when it happens live. <laughs> that man-made media is just kind of a blurry, it, it doesn't even rank as uh, miscongeniality. So, knowing this, I gave a talk a couple of weeks ago to uh, 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 a group of young people. I mean, I just eyeballed the audience, and there was nobody that looked over 40 in that audience. And their jobs are to do uh, corporate social responsibility. And they're like the green agents within uh, the food industry, right? So they're working for big conglomerate companies. And they, hired, they asked me to come out to talk about a campaign that I had worked on five years ago um, to seed the culture, to speed the adoption of information privacy as a new social norm. And as I told my story, this is when I had a brush, a flavor of how this works with younger audiences, this, this frequency, um, and how it happens live. Somebody asked me, what was the most difficult thing about that campaign? And it was an easy answer, is that I felt so alone when I was doing it. When I first got the gig, now I want to tell you, you can, oh, you've already figured this out, right? That I have a very niche business. Nobody's beaten down my door. <laughs> so I, I, I got asked um, by a global philanthropist to seed the culture, to get people to care about information privacy. And when I got that gig, I took my girlfriends out um, and I bought a couple of rounds to celebrate. So I told them what the gig was, and uh, I was met with blank stares. Uh, and then people kind of chipped in, you know. Um, uh, you know, privacy's dead. Because the prevailing wisdom at the time is what Scott McNeely from Sun Microsystems said. You have zero privacy. Get over it. Now look where we are five years later. What I'm trying to tell you is that changing the culture is not easy. It is difficult sometimes. Not because the work is hard. It's because sometimes it can leave you walking against the tide of your own prevailing culture. And as I told this story, and I went back to my room later that night, I was stunned to find maybe a dozen or so emails in my email box from people who were in the audience. This also does not happen to me often. Uh, and they wanted to tell me their story about how difficult it was for them to be alone in their jobs. And each one ended in some same way, saying, what can we do about this? How can we change this? How can we not be so alone in this? So it's been eight years since I uh, embarked on this journey to understand the Renaissance generation and the times that we live in. And so you're probably asking me now, Patricia, this sounds great. When do we get there? Well, we're obviously in our winter of, deep into our winter of discontent. We have a very powerful facilitating medium. Why are we still stuck? I think it has something to do with uh, something that Peter Thiel, who was the investor behind Facebook and PayPal, said in Wired Magazine, and that is, part of the reason the global economy is stalled is because we don't have a new story of the future. And as it turns out, having a story of the future in the collective consciousness is incredibly powerful, and it is enduring. So, so during the Industrial Revolution, our story of the future was about manufacturing. And after World War II, the story of the future was about aerospace and transportation. And after that, became, it became the story of telephony and communications, and then computation, and then communications and computation merged. And then we became the age of the internet. And now we're waiting. What's next? And this is where you come in. 
because the creation of something truly new, as Carl Jung said, is not accomplished by the intellect, but by the play instinct, acting out of necessity. And I believe that it will be the creative forces in our society that will help us discover our new story of the future. Because that story of the future also must carry with it, if we are going to act on this business of being in a renaissance, it must contain somewhere in it this enlightenment. It must lift our spirits, and it must help us be compassionate. So the topic of my talk was, will the future like you? And my answer is a conditional yes. And the condition is really this. What kind of stories are you going to tell us? Because if you want to speak at the higher frequency and be heard, it would help to have those stories be about the human condition. And it would help if you told them with love. Because that is always what helps people feel compassion toward one another. And without compassion, we won't have an enlightenment. So your job in all of this is not secondary. You can deliver it live, and you can deliver it with heart. And I look forward to what you have to tell us about our new story of the future. Thank you.